Whether you're just looking to kill some time or if you're just bored on the toilet, welcome to Jaotic MDG. My name is Jacob and thanks for joining me today. Presented to you now is about 20 minutes of useless information about these cool cardboard rectangles. This is a compilation of my YouTube shorts that I've posted from January to March of 2023, so if you like what you see, make sure to like the video below and subscribe for more MDG content. With that out of the way, let the useless information begin. So if any of that makes you upset, just remember, the next time your opponent storms off with a waste knot in their Nekasar deck, it's kind of on you. For the Magic 2015 core set, Wizards of the Coast invited outside game designers to create the aptly named designer cards. Some examples include Genesis Hydra by George Fan, the creator of Plants vs. Zombies, and Aggressive Mining by Notch, the creator of Minecraft. One of these designer cards stands out among the rest as Waste Knot was designed by, quote, the Magic Community. A series of votes were held in 2013 to determine the card's color, card type, rules text, and even the Matt Stewart artwork from a series of sketches. After some internal playtesting and balancing, this two-mana menace was finally printed into existence. But Air is human after all, so the next time that you feel like you made a terrible mistake, you got nothing to worry about. Believe me, Wizards of the Coast has done a lot worse. That's right, today we're going to be focusing on three Magic the Gathering cards with some seriously insane errors. The Strixhaven Commander decks immediately sparked conversation with a major error on Zaphi Thunder Conductor. Her Magecraft ability refers to her as Zaphi Thunder Collector, so for some time the card's official name was unknown. Its name was later confirmed to be Thunder Conductor in an Oracle Update article by Just Dunks. For some M20 releases and supplemental products, Corpse Knight was incorrectly printed with three toughness instead of two. Oddly, the Throne of Eldraine Brawl decks that included the misprint were bundled with a corrected copy of Corpse Knight, as well as an info card notifying players of the error. Finally, Worldwake's Walking Atlas seems to have all the markings of an artifact creature, right down to the artifact border. But strangely, the artifact type was omitted from the card. It later received an errata to add the missing card type, but since it's yet to be reprinted so far, it makes the misprint the only available version of Walking Atlas. Looks like Christmas came a little late this year. Let's open up Secret Lair Post Malone Backstage Pass. I'm a fan of Post Malone's music, and I've even been to one of his concerts. So at first, it came as a shock to me that he was into this nerdy card game I enjoyed. Despite my fandom, I wasn't going to pick up the Secret Lair because I've been burned by the product line before. Then the contents of the Secret Lair were revealed, and I couldn't say no. Jet Medallion alone makes back the investment, and I needed a Bolas' Citadel and a Kyrick for my Mono Black Commander deck. Either way, now I have some cool bling with zero opportunity cost. Thanks, Posty. So to hell with Team of Rhinos and Living End. You need to play more Cascade in your Commander decks. Here are three reasons why you should throw some chaos in your next game of Commander. For starters, Cascade spells are always two for ones. When you cast a spell with Cascade, you get to flip cards off the top of your library until you hit a cheaper spell, which you can then cast for free. By casting two separate spells, the most common counter spells in the format are far less effective at stopping your game plan. Also, you want to know what spells typically cost little mana? Removal spells and Mana Ramp, two staples of any Commander deck. Shardless Agent into Swords to Plowshares, anyone? How about the old Bloodbraid Elf into Kodama's Reach? Over on the top end of the curve, Cascade spells also act as a powerful way to end the game. Maelstrom Wanderer is a classic bomb in creature-heavy teamer decks, but Apex Predator can give green decks an insane 5 spell top end finisher. Your mana curve is extra important to consider when using Cascade, but you'll be leaving your opponents in the dust when Chaos is on your side. I haven't opened any packs in a while, so let's open up this Streets of Nukapenna bundle. This was my first time opening physical packs of Streets of Nukapenna, and also my very first experience with set boosters. And I gotta say, we certainly got some pretty good hits. Well, maybe I'll build a deck around that instead. If you want to check out the rest of this box opening, oh, that's what we're talking about, baby. As well as pulling a pretty sweet card from the list. <laughs> you can come check out the full video linked in the pinned comment. I hope you've been paying close attention. Have you noticed some of these insane references in Phyrexia all will be one? Beware of spoilers ahead because it's time to look at some of these completed callbacks. For those not in the loop, each of the new Mythic completed Planeswalkers have artwork that references one of their previous cards. Nahiri the Unforgiving stance, especially with her right arm, is noticeably similar to that of Nahiri, heir of the Ancients from Zendikar Rising. Luka bound to ruin is fittingly bonded with a Phyrexian beast, much like Ikoria's Luka Coppercoat Outcast prominently displays his tiger companion. Vraska Betrayal Sting is composed like a corrupted version of Return to Ravnica's Vraska the Unseen. Nissa Ascended Animus Outstretch Arms are reminiscent of Nissa who shakes the earth from War of the Spark. And finally, Jace the Perfected Mind's Phyrexian magic etchings are very recognizably based off of Jace the Mind Sculptor from Worldwake. If you want more random tidbits about Magic the Gathering, please consider liking this video and subscribing for more MTG content. Every magic set is jam-packed with draft chaff, but honestly, this card was extra stanky. 
Let's talk about one of the biggest duds in Magic's recent history. Hailing from the original Zendikar expansion, it's the notoriously terrible Mindless Null. A quick glance at Mindless Null is all you need to pass it down the draft table, but what if I told you this card was never meant to be so bad? During development, the zombie originally cost 1 and 1 black, but due to a miscommunication between designers Ken Nagel and Henry Stern, a typo changed its casting cost to 2 and a black. The development team thought it would be funny to print such an awful card, even to the dismay of Mark Rosewater, and Mindless Null was printed as is. When the the card was previewed in 2009, some players had less than nice things to say about Mindless Null. Comparisons were immediately drawn between it and Scathe Zombies from Alpha, back during a time where creatures were severely underpowered. Despite its trash tier status, Mindless Null serves as a reminder that even the most overlooked cards have a backstory rooted in human trial and error. In case you missed the news, Dranith Magistrate is the most evil creature to exist in the Commander format. Or at least that's what Magic Twitter will have you believe. Let's jump headfirst into the conversation and talk about this controversial hate bear. This 2 mana 1-3 doesn't seem too threatening on the surface, but it prevents your opponents from casting spells from anywhere other than their hand. Notably, this shuts down the command zone for everyone else at the table, locking their commanders away until the magistrate leaves the battlefield. Whether this card should be hit with a ban hammer or not has been the topic of conversation for years. While the commander format encourages deck building around a centralizing legendary creature, you have 99 other cards to slot in for disruption and removal spells. In a casual multiplayer format that encourages social politics, the three players can also work together to deal with the problem that the archenemy introduces. This justification has led to many problematic cards avoiding the ban list for years, so I don't see why this 2 mana creature with no protection gets the ire of an entire community. Any old deck can run a soul ring or an arcade signet. But sometimes the best card in your deck is a bulkpin sleeper agent. Today I want to talk about a card that always overperforms in my commander decks, and that card is Aqueous Form. Aqueous Form is one blue mana for an enchantment aura with enchant creature. Enchanted creature can't be blocked, and whenever enchanted creature attacks, scry one. When I look at this card, I immediately see major benefits for three common commander archetypes. First, Aqueous Form is an enchantment, which means it can easily slot into any enchantress or aura Voltron deck, tutor her up with Zerg the Enchanter, or get in huge beats with Tuvasa the Sunlit. Second, the enchanted creature can't be blocked, allowing for easy combat damage triggers against your opponents. Guarantee your flicker trigger with Brago King Eternal, or your cascade trigger with Yidra's Maelstrom Wielder. Finally, attacking with the enchanted creature lets you set up your top deck by scrying one. Easily re-roll the top of your deck when it matters with commanders like Elsha of the Infinite or Galia, Kindler of Hope. No matter how you choose to play it, pick up an Aqueous Form for your next game of Commander. Unlike those major errors from the last video, today we're going to be checking out some minor errors on Magic the Gathering cards. From strange spacing to words that shouldn't have even been on the card, we're going to take a look at some errors that Grammarly honestly could have fixed. The party mechanic from Zendikar Rising led to a bunch of cards being printed with reminder text explaining the four creature types that a full party consists of. It looks like someone got a little tired of copying and pasting that reminder text because Allied Assault's reminder text is somehow missing an end bracket. Commander Legends brought back a cycle of classic charms from Magic's early years, updated with the bullet formatting of modern modal spells. From that cycle, Dawn Charm was subject to scrutiny right away when players noticed the missing space between the words that and wood. Lastly, Dominaria United's Llanowar Green Widow is an excellent recursive threat in any domain deck, but it's clear that someone at Wizards really wanted to make absolute certain that its ability made it enter the battlefield tapped. Why you may ask? Because the extended art version was printed to include the word tap twice. Oh brother, this one's gonna ruffle some feathers. As more cards get printed into Magic the Gathering, the modern format continues to change. So today, I want to talk about three Magic cards that I would unban from the modern format, just to shake the meta up a little bit. Back when Modern was first introduced in 2011, the initial ban list included a bizarre Kamigawa rare called Blazing Shoal. The idea was, an infect player could play a turn 1 Glistener Elf, then turn 2 Pitch Progenitus to the Shoal and attack for 11 infect. In a world post Fatal Push and Pact of Negation, this turn 2 victory seems much more easily disruptible. Speaking of the OG ban list, why is Umazawa's Jitae on there? Modern circa 2011 would have been overrun by this equipment. Hell, two activations of minus one minus one would be backbreaking enough. However, in a meta dominated by Archon of Cruelties, Murktad Regents, and the Evoke Elementals, this Gigachad artifact might be slow enough to be safe by today's standards. Oh, and unban Splinter Twin, you cowards. For more hot takes on the modern ban list and more, make sure to like the video and subscribe for more MTG content. These mistakes were painful to relive, but sometimes even the most seasoned Magic the Gathering players make some pretty wild and incorrect speculation during pre-release. Today I'm going to take a trip down bad memory lane to talk about a few cards that I speculated on and drop the bag. 
In the lead up to Cons of Tarkir block, I was beyond hyped to finally get a name and identity for what would become the Teamer Clan. During pre-release, Savage Knuckleblade was the prized jewel of standard rug tempo decks, but we all know how the story goes. An overlooked pachyderm named Siege Rhino snuck through preview season and became the mid-range creature of choice, leaving my beautiful ogre boy in the dust. Claim to fame from our devastation always seemed nuts to me for modern. One black mana to reanimate a wide range of the metagame's biggest threats, plus the chance to pump and expedite them later in the game? That sounded like a slam dunk play card to me, but sadly that future never came to be. Nowadays it occasionally sees play in Jeskai Ascendancy and Death Shadow decks, but it's a far cry from what could have been a format staple. This video might age pretty poorly, but Phyrexia All Will Be One is almost upon us. So before the set finally drops, let's predict how it'll affect magic as a whole. Let's start off with the four main mechanics. Toxic, Corrupted, Oil Counters, and FOUR MIRADEN! Toxic is bound to see play in Standard, Modern, and Commander for aggro kills, and Corrupted works in tandem as a nice payoff. For Mirrodin is another take on Living Weapon, and Oil Counters feel too restricted, so both mechanics will probably stick to limited play. In terms of individual cards, I see the Eternal Wanderer becoming a staple of new Standard. Her plus one flicker recycles ETB triggers, and her minus four is a mini tragic errant. If Infect returns in Modern, it's thanks to Venerated Rot Priest. The modern Modern meta has become very removal heavy, so its triggered ability will be a huge boost to the struggling creatures that Infect runs. Finally, Elish Norn, Mother of Machines will be an obviously popular card across formats, but I bet on Tekathal Inquiry Dominus becoming a premier commander for its sheer versatility. For more absolutely whack predictions, be sure to like the video and subscribe for more MTG content. Can you feel all the love in the air? Valentine's Day is very quickly approaching, so today, let's count down the top 5 couples in Magic the Gathering. Number 5 is Olivia Voldaren and Edgar Markov. In Magic's best portrayal of real life, a young woman in her prime marries an old man for his wealth and power. Number 4 is Chandra and Nyssa. After teaming up to incinerate Ulamog and Kozilek, these two gatewatchers connect on a deeper level than their ley lines, if you know what I mean. Number 3 is Huatli and Sahili. Huatli's first planeswalk post Immortal Sun lands her on Kaladesh. In a moment that reads like horny fanfiction, the two planeswalkers embrace and become one of Magic's most iconic LGBT romances. Number 2 is Jason Vraska. Jason's amnesia the arc on Ixalan gave his character some much needed depth where he romantically bonds with his once rival Vraska. Sadly, it looks like these two will be bonding over the glory of Phyrexia now. Number one is Felden and Loran. After Urza ends the Brothers War with the Golgothian Silex, Loran succumbs to her injuries and passes away. This isn't even a joke, this story is up levels of tragic. So I guess that answers the question, can I break even on this Phyrexia All Will Be One pre-release kit? I got this kit from my LGS for 35 Canadian dollars, which in Freedom Units is about three Big Mac combos. Let's see what we get. First up was this Foil Soulless Jailer. It's a pretty neat card, but sadly has no home in any of my decks. Pack 1 had a Sea Chrome Coast, which is a pretty nice reprint, but unfortunately I don't have much use for it. Pack 2 had a Malira the Living Cure. It's a decent card, but one that's situational at best. In Pack 3 I opened an alternate art Kaito Dancing Blade, which isn't super valuable, but I can use it in my Aminatu Blink deck. Pack 4 housed Mirex, a card that would be great for me were it not for the fact that I use Atraxa for my Infect deck. For Pack 5 I got a Mind Splice Apparatus, which will go perfectly in one of my Elsha decks. Finally, Pack 6 had an alternate art Azuri, Stalker of Spheres, and yeah, let's not beat the bush. From a financial perspective, this pre-release kit was hot garbo. Over the past weekend at Philly MagicCon, we just got our first look at March of the Machines. Let's check out what we know so far. Things look grim across the multiverse as a reprinted set of tap lands depict various planes being infected with Phyrexian oil. The landscapes aren't all that are getting completed. We got a new Heliod that transforms into a Phyrexian god. Our favorite elemental Omnath has also seen better days, sporting a new 5 color variant with Phyrexian black mana in its casting cost. We also got to see Chandra's first reaction to seeing Nyssa completed from the previous set. Coming to the aid of the multiverse are pairs of legends from their respective home planes. So far, we know of Thalia and the Gitrog monster from Innistrad, Drana and Linvala from Zendikar, Yargul and Multani from Dominaria, and Galta and Maverin from Ixalan. Finally, we got artwork for a cycle of Invasion of cards, depicting the Phyrexian invasion of several known planes. I predict these cards will be modal enchantments similar to the Siege cycle from Fate Reforged. Which of these teasers are you most excited for? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. I'm sure plenty of you remember when Siege Rhino was one of the most devastating cards in all of Standard. But did you know that this card changed quite a lot during development? The card that would become Siege Rhino started as a counter to Liliana of the Veil, who was originally supposed to be reprinted in M15. 
15. The Rhino originally cost 3 mana, drained for 2 life, and had an anti-discard clause similar to Loxodon Smiter. Over the course of the next few months, Siege Rhino would lose 1 toughness, gain 1 toughness, cost 1 more mana and gain 1 toughness, drain for 3 life, gain 1 power and lose 2 toughness, gain 1 toughness, drain for 2 life, cost 1 less mana and lose 1 power and toughness, gain 1 toughness, trade anti-discard for can't be countered, cost 1 more mana and gain 1 power and toughness, trade can't be countered for trample, and finally drain for 3 life before becoming the menace we know today. For more exhaustive development stories, be sure to like the video and subscribe for more MTG content. With all the new poison counter shenanigans lately, players have been asking the question, should we be increasing the number of poison counters in Commander? No? Let me explain why. According to the rules of Magic, a player loses the game if they have 10 or more poison counters. In 60 card formats, this number equates to half your starting life total. Not too bad, but this can become an issue in Commander where the starting life total is 40. That can't possibly be fair, right? Well, as the Infect player, you have to deal 10 Infect damage in 1v1 matches. In Commander, your goal is to eliminate 3 players with a total of 30 poison counters, which can be exceptionally difficult. Single target pump spells are generally bad in Commander when other players can play bigger, more valuable creatures. Even with absurd poison counter generators like Scytherix and Lightsteel Colossus, you face an uphill battle when you make your toxic goal clear and become public enemy number one. I can sympathize with the feel bad feeling of losing to poison, but I guarantee you the infect player will feel much worse with a new gargantuan task in front of them. As bizarre as this may sound, this magic card does not exist. Huh? This is the strange story behind Zalortha, Strength Incarnate. From Dominaria to Corset 2021, Wizards of the Coast would print exclusive cards not found in booster packs for their buy a box promotion. This venture gave us some bonkers cards like Nexus of Fate and Kenrith the Returned King. But for Ikoria's buy a box promo, they stylized an exclusive promo just like the Godzilla Borderless cards in the base set. Godzilla King of the Monsters is an interesting take on a reverse Doran the Siege Tower type commander. But what's with this line of text here? Zalortha Strength Incarnate is the name of the in universe version of this Godzilla promo. But since the card has never been reprinted, this universe's within card doesn't exist. Exist yet. Magic Arena included this legend in its Ikoria release with proper art, but in terms of paper magic, this name is nothing more than a placeholder for a card that's yet to be printed. Well, if you thought error cards were funny, mistranslations of Magic the Gathering cards can lead to some pretty wild mistakes. Let's take a look at three vastly different examples. Ascend Upon the Sinful from Shadows Over Innistrad is a powerful, if overcosted, creature based board wipe. The French version of this card, however, was immediately joked about throughout the community when people noticed the mistranslated title. French uses accented vowels, so instead of using an acute accented E to translate to sinners, they use a circumflex accented E, which translates to fisherman. Ugin the Spirit Dragon, it's a pretty good card. Its minus X wrath effect can easily sway the game in your favor. The German version of Ugin is even more busted because you don't have to pay anything. The German card mistranslated X or less to X or more, meaning that you wouldn't have to lose any loyalty counters to board wipe. This error was quickly noticed and eroded later. Finally, Stoic Rebuttal is a fine counterspell in an artifact based deck, becoming a true counterspell if you have Metalcraft. Well, not in Portuguese though, because they completely omitted the counter target spell line. At least it only costs 2 mana. So the next time you sit down for a game of Commander, crush your beta opponents with this underrated Commander card, Alpha Authority. Alpha Authority is 1 generic and 1 green mana for an enchantment aura with enchant creature. Enchanted creature has hexproof and can't be blocked by more than one creature. Protecting your commander from targeted removal is a valuable asset to keep them on the battlefield. Just look at the popularity of Swiftfoot Boots and Lightning Greaves. On top of that, Alpha Authority grants pseudo evasion by only allowing one creature to block the enchanted creature. This effect can be useful on large commanders with trample like Gishath Sun's Avatar or Yidris Maelstrom Wielder, ensuring your combat damage trigger each turn by preventing multiple blockers. This ability is especially useful on commanders with menace. When assigning blockers, all blocking conditions must be satisfied for a legal block to occur. By only being able to be blocked by one creature and two or more creatures simultaneously, there is no legal block available, essentially giving your commander unblockable. Suit up Lathro Blade of the Elves and create a ton of elf warrior tokens, grab a bunch of gates with nine fingers keen, or guarantee your poison counter with Vishgraz the Doomhive. Be sure to like the video for more epic commander tech and subscribe for more MTG content. I know it's a common complaint, but are Modern Horizon sets bad for Magic the Gathering? Let's talk about it. From their inception, the Modern Horizon sets were designed to add more complex cards into Eternal formats, with emphasis on the modern format. This complexity is achieved by using dozens of returning keywords and mashing them together in fun and interesting new combinations. Cards like Throws of Chaos and Feaster of Fools are excellent examples of designs that play on the combination of keyworded mechanics. In my opinion, these designs are the crowning achievement of Modern Horizons and the biggest factor for their continuation. Unfortunately, the increase in complexity and emphasis on creating new staples for Eternal formats has allowed some problematic card designs to slip through the cracks. 
Saturn has had a massive rotation in the last few years, now being dominated by the Evoke Elementals, Ragavan, Murktide region, and reanimation targets like Sarah's Emissary and Archon of Cruelty. Some card designs are so pushed they've had to be banned in multiple formats. One card in Modern, two cards in Legacy, three cards in Popper, and one card in all three formats. So do you think we should get more Modern Horizon sets in the future? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe while you're at it. With so many different worlds to choose from, Magic's multiverse is full of so many beloved planes that are just begging for a revisit. Here's my list of the top 5 planes that we need to return to. Number 5 is Capetta, and all the other new one-off planes. Since Wizards of the Coast ended the block structure of set releases, we've been bouncing from plane to plane way too quickly. Planes like Capenna, Kaldheim, and Arcavios deserve a proper revisit sometime in the coming years. Number 4 is Alara. Now that Alara's been reborn into a single plane, we're begging to see how its inhabitants have held up for the past 14 years. Number 3 is Mercadia. The last time we spent any time on this plane, people were freaking out about Y2K and downloading music off of Napster. But with its return to March of the Machine, we'll surely get another glimpse at Mercadia someday soon. Number 2 is Lorwyn. Shadowmoor. This fan favorite locale is primed and ready for a new storyline, so hopefully there will be something left of Lorwyn Shadowmoor after being invaded by the Phyrexians. Number 1 is Tarkir. The five clans were the most enjoyable part of Tarkir block, so this plane desperately needs to be done justice. 